committee um, for October 18th. And um, so if I could have Dr. Adams and Mr. Sy come forward and we will begin with our first agenda item, which is um, really sharing with the curriculum committee our athletics program in uh, BCPS. Good evening. Um, I'm here with Mike Sai, our incredible coordinator of athletics. He has been um, losing his voice during the day, so I'm going to wind up talking probably a little bit more than I anticipated, which is fine. You, you all that know me know I don't mind talking. <laughs> so <laughs> we're here tonight to talk about our athletic programs in the county. And before we started, we felt that we should um, share some distinctions between athletics and physical education because those two do get often uh, do often get confused and Mr. Sai gets questions often that have to do with physical education and Ms. Prozer, our uh, supervisor of physical education, often gets questions about the athletics mm -hmm. program. So we thought we would just share just a little bit of information that isn't in the slide deck that just differentiates those programs. Our um, physical education program is required by COMAR um, and it is re required to be in place from K to 12 and as you all know, students are required to earn physical education credits to graduate from high school. and so. So our phys ed program has an established curriculum. It covers many different sports and physical activities and is based on participation, not interest, right? Our athletic programs um, are not required to happen, but of course we're all used to having athletic programming, especially at the secondary level and at high schools. But those are um, students um, competitively opting in rather than being required to participate as a part of that educational program. And although, um, as we'll speak to in tonight's presentation, our middle school program is, our middle school athletics program is a teaching program it is not required to have a necessarily a curriculum in the same way that our physical education program does. So I just wanted to share that little tidbit of information. Um, hopefully that's helpful to all the millions and millions of people watching at home <laughs> <laughs> to understand some of those differences. All right, so um, this is before you now is the philosophy of the Office of, of Athletics. Um, and it's really, we're looking here to really um, support the philosophy that this idea of a quality program supports students' um, social, physical, and educational development, and that uh, the interscholastic program in particular supports the systems of the, supports the mission of the school system. We know that we have many students for whom the athletic program is a major um, social emotional driver for them in terms of coming to school every day because they get to participate with their friends and team mate and because they get to have that connection with adults in the building who typically are their coaches and assistant coaches and things like that. So in BCPS, we have two types of athletic programs. We have our interscholastic athletic program, and this is typically what people think about when they think about athletics in school systems, and we'll talk about what that means and what it doesn't mean. And we also have what's called our corollary allied sports, and I'll explain what each of those are over the next couple slides. Our interscholastic athletes, those are our individual and team sports, so basketball, wrestling, soccer, um, and those are governed by requirements of the Maryland Public Secondary Schools Athletic Association. Um, they're also governed by some Comar state regulations around athletics, not curriculum and education. And then we have in the county policies, procedures, and rules around how the interscholastic athletic program occurs. On the contrary, our corollary allied sports are, aren't governed by the Maryland Public Secondary School Athletic Association, and they, our corollary allied sports program were specifically designed to bring together students who are interested in athletics who are disabled with other students who are non-disabled that wish to participate in the program together. Now, welcome. I, uh, welcome to our world. Back-to-back <laughs> -to -back meetings. Um, so getting back to our interscholastic program, um, these are the particular requirements in order to be a student athlete. Um, you need to be under the age of 18 by August 31st of the school year that you intend to participate. Um, your GPA needs to be at least 2.0 or greater, and you can't, cannot have more than one grade that is either failing, incomplete, or a medical excuse. Of course, we need parent permission. There, are, there is a pre-participation physical that students need to acquire from their physician. And then um, students and their parents are required to complete two forms. One, um, both of these forms are forms that um, provide information and then um, acknowledgement from the student athlete and the parent that they understand um, 
and have awareness of the fact that sudden cardiac arrest incidents can happen, what those signs and symptoms are, um, and in the same way, concussion awareness for our sports that have um, any likelihood that someone might um, obtain a concussion. Those are two also um, forms that are required um, in order for you to participate in an interscholastic athletic program. As a contrast, if we talk about our allied sports, um, you can be a student in grades 9 to 12 and there is no age requirement because if you recall, our students with disabilities are able to attend school up until their 21st birthday. So there isn't that same um, under the age of 18 by August 31st as there is with the interscholastic program. Um, you need to be making satisfactory progress towards either your diploma or your certificate of program completion. You still need parent permission and you do also still need um, the physical. There is an additional requirement that we didn't put on the slide because we thought it might be confusing, but um, if you've already participated in um, an interscholastic sport in any way uh, and then don't make the team, you aren't able to jump over and be an allied sports athlete for that season. So there is that also constraint um, because we know we have, um, we know that it is often disappointing when students try out to join a team and don't make the team. And um, the corollary allied sports are really for students who want the opportunity to play, um, but not necessarily at that highest level of competition where there might be other things involved like championships and things like that. So in, t in thinking about our interscholastic and our allied programs, first wanted to show you the sports that we have available at the middle school level. Um, our middle school program is a relatively new program. It's been in place for a few years now. Um, and I, I'm happy to say that Mr. Sai has grown and his team, his small but mighty team have grown this program without much budgetary expansion. So um, <laughs> we've been growing programs at the middle school and at the middle school level, uh, the programs are really about teaching students the sport. Um, it's really about education, ed education around how the sport is designed, how you play it, the mechanics of the sport. Whereas when we get to the interscholastic program, in most instances, we expect students to understand most of the mechanics and the coaching is really about refining um, their skills and the teamwork involved in order to be um, successful. And so you'll note that we have a total of six sports that are available at the middle school level currently, and one of those is allied softball. If we look at the high school level, we have many more sports. Um, I believe that count is 21. Um, and again, these are more of the traditional things that, things that people think about when they think about the um, high school athletic program. We've got badminton and cheerleading, and we're proud that we promote cheerleading as a competitive sport um, and not as an add-on to another sport. Or we have lacrosse and softball and all those other things. We also have allied soccer, allied bowling, and allied softball. I got you. All right, in um, 1994, Baltimore County put together the first allied sports program. And again, this is an inclusive environment for students with disabilities. But the, the part that makes it so special, is they're participating alongside kids without disabilities. So they feel like they're part of the school and not being treated separately or differently, following the same rules and regulations that um, Renard has put forth. So BCPS was one of the first schools to, um, districts in the United States to actually put together an allied program and is often used as a model for many other um, districts to, to follow behind. As you see uh, in the picture on the left, um, we have what is called a pumpkin bowl. Uh, and, and if you really want to know what athletics is really truly all about, is to come out to one of our allied sports uh, contests. The pumpkin bowl is held at Franklin High School. It's coming up actually this October the 29th. Uh, we have every single school in Baltimore County participates in this program. And it's just a time when we come together to celebrate our allied students. Um, and we have you know special guests come out. Uh, it's like a round robin tournament and Franklin High School does it exceptional job in terms of providing food for the athletes and making it an environment that uh, is really great. And again, and, and on the right hand side is our ally softball tournament that we have at Catonsville High School. Um, we've partnership with um, the Baltimore Orioles and Field of Dreams and they came out with Mike Bordick and, and celebrated our ally sports programs uh, under, this, under softball and had a great time and a great tournament for the kids. Um, one of the things that we also um, are really extremely proud of about the, as it relates to our corollary program is that we partnership with um, 
two entities, um, Brittany Reese, who is an Olympic long jump champion, and, and Acadia Wendells, to actually provide scholarships. I think four years ago we started this program where it started out with just one scholarship to a boy, and then we expanded it to two scholarships, one male, one female, and each year uh, we're looking at our allied programs and offering um, scholarships to two of our student athletes to go on to vocational training or college or program of their choice. Uh, we wanted to share some data uh, with the committee, and so these are our um, athlete, athletic participation numbers for last school year. We had over 10,000 student athletes participate in our high school interscholastic program, and you can see the breakdown by gender. Uh, we had a little over 5,500 boys and almost 4,600 um, female students. And then at the middle school level, between grades six, seven, and eight, we had uh, a little over 3,000 students participate in the middle school interscholastic program. We know that there's, um, research shows that there's a positive correlation between participation in athletics and student achievement. And the, every year we publish what's called the All Academic Team. And so this is a, a publication that lists our student athletes. And if you remember, the minimum requirement for participation is a GPA of at least 2.0. The All Athletic Team are students that have a GPA, GPA of at least 3.0 or higher. And typically, um, per season, we have about 65% of our athletes who attain this distinction and have that GPA and those numbers for last school year are um, before you on the slide and of course the reason the winter numbers are relatively lower is because there are fewer winter sports than fall than there are in fall and in spring one of the things that we we really pride ourselves in is, is looking at the whole student athlete. And part of that is the academic part, which we always have great coaches to mentor our kids, make sure they're doing study hall and tutoring and all the things that need to be successful in the classroom and then also in the field, which ultimately culminates in a lot of our schools, a lot of our kids getting opportunities for scholarships. So uh, as you see on the monitor, we have um, several of our signing days. Our schools like to celebrate our student athletes who have uh, received some type of uh, grant and aid or scholarship towards the school of their choice. Um, they, they, they meet and, and have an opportunity um, just to talk about their schools, have their parents there, and it's really a, a, a great feeling for those kids to know that all the hard work that they've done over all the years has finally culminated in the opportunity to, to further their education. So um, we created a do you know, did you know slide. Um, this was a moment of privilege mostly for me. When I uh, moved into this position about 15 months ago, I inherited Mr. Sai in the athletic program, and I began to learn a lot of things that I never knew before um, going on in the school system. You know, you think football, football, and, so, and spring softball, and it's a whole, there are, there's a lot more involved to it than that. So um, the Office of Athletics is overseeing these programs at our 24 high schools and our 27 middle schools. Um, Mike and his team work to professionally develop our 53 athletic administrators. So at the high school level, you'll hear the term athletic directors. Um, each high school has an athletic director, and then the middle schools have activity coordinators. I think I said that right. Advisors. Ad <laughs> activity advisors, athletic advisors. Um, we employ every year over um, 1,300 officials. Um, there are more than 4,000 athletic contests that are managed. Um, we work with the Department of Transportation to transport our students. We certify coaches in care and prevention, and then the office is also responsible for monitoring the eligibility of students, so it's um, no small no small feat on what goes on. And um, as we move into the cooler months, one of the things that Mr. Sai and I talk about on a weekly basis are what are all the different athletic activities that are going on in the event that the superintendent should need to postpone or cancel activities. So his aren't all of the events, but there's certainly a large portion of the events that are going on every week and in the evening and over the weekend. Um, and in conclusion, um, this is sort of a mission statement of the office, this idea that we want to promote and encourage um, in the interscholastic program in order to support administrators, coaches, and um, teachers in supporting students. It's really about our students and them being involved and engaged in school and them meeting with success. And we know that for many of our students, the athletic program keeps them engaged and it provides post-secondary opportunities for them and their families. And with that, we will happily take any questions you might have. I, thank you very much. Mr. Sai, you, your voice sounds pretty good, though. I know. I'm trying yeah, to. Yeah, you, you're back. <laughs> um, a couple of things. Um, I know there are um, medical or physical therapy or some kind of professional 
uh, participation in the sports and uh, particularly in interscholastic. So is that is that by school or is that by sport or is that just random? In terms of on the field or on the sideline? Well, yeah, all the schools, I mean, it's mandatory. It's actually through Comar. Uh, it's mandatory that all the kids must meet certain standards as it relates to the, having the physical parent permit and, and the necessary permissions to participate. So um, each school handles that individually uh, and then reports it to our office to make sure that we're, you know, making the, making those kids are making progress towards playing. Yeah, but are there docs on the sideline? Oh, okay. or are there oh, oh, therapists oh, on yes. the sideline? Yes, we have uh, athletic trainers, certified athletic trainers. And um, this board was just, just recently gave us the contract authority to have an expanded contract that enables us to finally um, make sure that we have an athletic trainer at every high school and to move that also down to our, our, our middle school level. Um, in the past, we have used a combination of um, either private contractors who um, contracted with the schools or staff in the building who were certified as athletic trainers and going to a new contract allowed us to make sure that services were equitable and across the school system so we do have that yeah two more things one um, heat stroke has been in the news um, and we talked about concussions and we talked mm -hmm. about uh, sudden cardiac arrest but is there any specific protocol about heat stroke well, each school has a, um, a protocol as it relates to um, making sure that our student athletes are safe, and not just for heat stroke or concussions and that kind of stuff. Um, as Renard had just mentioned, we only had seven trainers at our schools, and now that we've gotten permission from the board, we're up to 16 across the county, so we've still got eight more schools that we need to have trainers at. But we do have EMTs that we subcontract out to to be at our athletic contest for those schools that don't have trainers, and they do have protocols. We actually uh, took the initiative this summer to go out and buy um, cooling pools for all the schools because we've seen what happened at the University of Maryland and some of the other schools um, that are local regarding trying to make sure that we keep our kids safe, prevent from heat stroke and have all the protocols in place to address those accordingly. Excellent. And what, what Mr. Sai will do, what he, what he didn't add, he won't brag on himself, is when we know we're entering portions of weather where there are larger heat advisories or things like that, he sends reminders every day about what the athletic directors and the coaches should be doing, providing for students, whether they should be practicing indoors or outdoors, whether they should have their tanks ready in the event that someone might become ill. Great. And then last, and I don't mean to dominate the conversation, how much of the coaching that is done at the high school level is by teachers who have kind of a side mm -hmm. uh, second career as a coach as opposed to hiring somebody that's not uh, kind of in the academic staff? That's a great question. So um, we, we pride ourselves in having, you know, teachers slash coaches uh, on our staff. But I will say that it's about 65 percent of our coaches are non-teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's becoming more and more difficult. However, we do make sure they do the necessary training to, um, to be out there with our student athletes. Um, again, um, we are, we're still encouraging more coaches to come from the teacher ranks, but we have about 65% of them that are, that are non-teachers. At our middle school, is 100% our teachers, though. The, the law does require us to first, um, to make sure teachers have that opportunity first and then gives you um, stipulations and circumstances by which if you, if you don't have a teacher who will coach, then you can hire someone who isn't a teacher to coach the sport. Dr. Adams, you've learned a lot in 15 I months. Ha I've learned, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> Thank you. Great presentation. I just had a question about when the Franklin High School game was and what time. <laughs> oh, it, it's October 29th. Um, I think it's going to start around 5, 530. Uh, there's actually a playoff game that same day. So we have to push the time back to the to the start because we have a state playoff game that same day at Franklin. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to um, previewing um, instructional materials, if I could have uh, Dr. Wisted. Mr. Handy and Dr. Woolridge uh, come forward. And um, we'll be sharing with you um, the many facets of our partnership with CCBC. So you will be seeing in an upcoming um, board meeting a con contract coming forward uh, related to our partnership with CCBC, and we want to ensure that you have a full understanding of the, the many aspects of our partnership with them. Go ahead, Dr. Wiston. Okay. So 
That was my first talking point for my first slide. We, <laughs> we have a contract coming up, which is why we're here with you. Um, we've had a partnership with CCBC, um, and so you will see at, that as part of, we had a memorandum of understanding um, through the years, and so part of the contract will kind of explain the relationship that we have between the two. So um, our early college access programs are all dual enrollment programs. So here's the definition, which means that they are enrolled in a BCPS high school as well as um, being enrolled in a Maryland University system at the same time, so being dual enrolled. The first program under the dual enrollment umbrella is our parallel enrollment program. And this program has been around in our county for years. It's an opportunity for our students to, uh, our high school students, to also enroll in college courses. And our partnership with CCBC allows any freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior to attend both their local high school or a magnet high school and CCBC at a 50% tuition discount. And that is a discount granted by CCBC. It's a wonderful opportunity. Um, and they are unlimited in how many courses they can take with that. And they can take those courses in any semester including during the summer. The next program is one that came uh, as a result of Senate Bill 740, and it's our tuition-free program. Uh, Senate Bill 740 said uh, students uh, mandated that our high school students should take up to four courses tuition-free. And so BCPS once again partnered with CCBC and said, since you're already paying 50% tuition reduction for our students, we will match that for our sophomores, juniors, and seniors, provided they meet a 2.5 um, GPA requirement unweighted and cumulative and also um, these students are only able to take those four courses either in the spring or fall semester the only restriction that we place on that is that we ask that our seniors do not take a graduation course in the spring of their semester uh, year if in the spring of their senior year <laughs> um, if it is a dual credit course, which I'm gonna come to next. Um, so the, super exciting, sophomores, juniors, and seniors with a 2.5 or higher GPA can take up to four courses completely tuition free. And our students who are farms, also um, their fees are waived. It's a wonderful opportunity for them. The next pro program I just mentioned is our dual credit program. Um, before Senate Bill 740 uh, came along, we had five courses in BCPS um, that were uh, approved for dual credit, meaning they could the students could take the college level course at CCBC, earn the college credit, but it would also count for their high school credit. That list is now over 50 courses, which is just outstanding. Um, and you can see um, the list of the different departments uh, or content areas that these courses are available through. We also do not restrict our students from receiving dual credit at other Maryland University System schools. It's just there, there's more of a process to it because we don't have an MOU with each of those schools. So if students are interested in taking a course at Towson or Morgan or Maryland or any of our other Maryland University System schools, there is a form that they fill out prior to registering for the course. It goes through our curriculum offices for approval and then they too can also uh, earn dual credit through another univers Maryland University system. And because we have all of these amazing opportunities for our students, there is an opportunity for any BCPS high school student to graduate from high school with an AA degree. It takes a lot of planning, it takes a lot of grit, it takes a lot of determination, it takes um, some financial support from their parents, transportation support from their parents, but this can be done. And students who express an interest and um, you know, early on in their ninth grade and show that they have the academic stamina to com uh, complete both their high school program and a college program, they are supported by their high school counselors who are amazing and the CCBC um, staff that really helps guide these students through this program. So although this is not structured, it is certainly an opportunity for any student in BCPS. Mr. Handy? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wildrich. All right, the next program we'll talk about is the Diploma to Career Program, or what we call D to C. This is an early college access program for high school students in partnership with CCBC. 
and it's designed for students who want to earn sought after certificates in fields of study that would lead to greater job opportunities and enhanced hiring potential upon graduation from high school. This program may also build upon the articulated credits, which we're going to discuss later, which can be earned by career and technology education or CTE students. Early college, um, all early college access discounts apply within the D2C program. And to learn more information about CTE completers, um, you probably can see me, which several of you all have already. So. <laughs> and because, as Mr. Handy said, um, we have this D2C program, and we certainly want to encourage more students to apply for the um, both not only the D2C program, but the D2D D program, the Diploma to Degree program, we started thinking, what are some of the barriers that we need to take down for our students? So, you know, we have the tuition free program for students who qualify. Well, another barrier is transportation. And so we have developed with CCBC what we call on location courses. And that's when the CCBC adjunct professors come to our high schools and teach their college level classes in our high school classrooms. And it just means that students who might not be able to get to a CCBC campus can also access these college courses um, at their own high schools. And because that was so successful, we decided <laughs> let's just have our kids, let's create a magnet program where everyone in the program has the opportunity in a structured manner with support both at their high school and on the CCBC campus to earn their high school degree and an AA degree. And so ladies and gentlemen, we are in our second year. So we have freshmen and sophomores in high school who are in the early college program at Woodlawn High School. And those students have a curriculum laid out for them for the next four years that may enable them to complete not only their high school diploma, but an AA degree in four years, which is amazing. Right now, they're taking all of their classes freshman and sophomore year at Woodlawn. Next year, the first cohort will be actually um, attending first period at Woodlawn and then taking a bus to CCBC, taking their college slash high school courses there, their college dual credit courses there, and then hopping on a, a bus back to Woodlawn so they can participate in athletics or they can um, participate in after school coaching or they can catch their bus home. <laughs> so that program is super exciting and it's not our only one, right, Mr. Handy? <laughs> <laughs> So in addition to our early <laughs> wait, wait, more. So in addition to our early college program at Woodlawn High School, we have Pathways in Technology Early College High School or PTEC at Dundalk. This is an early college high school model that allows students at no cost to them earn a high school diploma and a specified associate's degree in up to six years. Uh, PTEC also includes one-on-one -on -one mentoring, workplace visits and skills instruction paid summer internships, and first-in-line consideration for job openings with the school's partnering companies. And we're very happy to report that we have four partnering companies, and those are um, Alvin Catt, KCI Technologies, Stanley Black & Decker, and Whiting Turner. I think it's you still. Okay. <laughs> All right. Also related to um, our early college access programs and CTE is our articulated credit program. Um, this allows high school students who graduate and successfully complete a specific CTE program, JROTC program, or advanced technology education sequence of courses to earn college credits. This program consists of the development of the high school curricula that allows students to request credit for introductory level community college courses. In addition to these articulated credits, our CT students also have the opportunity to earn industry recognized credentials. And for example, we have our um, BCPS alum here pictured on the screen, and this is Nick Nataro. Um, he completed the interactive media program, interactive media production program at Eastern Technical High School and graduated with certifications in Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop. And that's into addition to the, I believe it was 30 or more college credits that Nick earned. So that's what we call, um, in CT world, we call that our value added, articulated credits and industry certifications. And then finally, we have a slide that um, CCBC has loaned us, which just talks about the enrollment over time between um, fall of 2016 through now, so you can see there's been a large increase over time, and a part of that is because we've been removing barriers um, for students as well as uh, getting the word out through their school counselor about um, 
the programs that we have in our partnership with CCBC. So we are available for questions. <laughs> Great work. I had a question about the program. How, how does it work? Is it like you apply to be the program, to be in the program, the ECAP program, the one at Woodlawn, or do you run the risk as a student just entering Woodlawn of just being pushed in there and you don't want to be put in there? That's my first question. It, it's, it's a magnet program, so students apply okay. to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I also had another question. So if a child is showing that they cannot handle Mm -hmm. the workload in a sense, whatever classes comes with it, do they get put out of the program or what are the resources added to help them? It's such a great question. Um, we did find with our first cohort um, that we had some learning, um, uh, some le a, a learning curve, right, with any new program you do. And so CCBC has hired staff that actually is housed in the Woodlawn ECAP program to support our students. So they're in there supporting the curriculum. They're running coach classes during lunches and after school. Um, and we, uh, it, all of the students in the magnet program also participate in the AVID program because the AVID program is designed, as you know, <laughs> is designed to support students in courses. And so we feel that those supports are really um, helping students and preventing loss. Unfortunately, like in any program, sometimes you do experience loss and um, the students in this program follow the same magnet uh, requirements that any other magnet student re would require. So they have to pass their magnet classes. They, there's a probation period. And then ultimately, if they're not showing improvement and they don't meet the magnet criteria, they um, are sent back to their locally zoned schools. I will say one benefit of this program that I'm not sure any other magnet program has is that they can still continue to take college courses um, when they're ready because this program is really open to anybody. That's just the one magnet structured program that we have, uh, one of two, excuse me. Thank you. How many, uh, how many students are in the Woodlawn program? We currently have 150 in over the two cohorts. Wow. Yes. And Dr. Wisted, when is the contract coming to the board? Um, it's the November contract meeting and board meeting. I think that's November 8th. 8th. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Thursday, November mm -hmm. 8th. Um, and the CCBC is still Catonsville, Essex, and Dundalk. Is that correct? Are there three campuses? Dundalk. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. and, and then they have the extension campuses right. at the schools. Um, so the, I know there's oh. extension, Randallstown, Randallstown Owings Mills, mm -hmm. uh, Hunt Valley. Hunt maybe. Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and and the degree, the, the D to D, what's that stand for, something? Diploma, Diploma to degree. Diploma to degree. And that's been around for how many graduating classes? Just a few? Um, the f we got the d <laughs> so that, we had our first cohort, so the first year there was a grant, mm -hmm. and um, 18 of the 20 students who participated in that little bit more structured grant mm -hmm. did graduate with their diploma degree. And I would say that was 20, I want to say it was 2014. So but, but there have been students in the past that with family support and counselor, you know, and, and being very structured that could have graduated with that right. without this formalized kind of program. Right. So yeah. it's just leading to my question about um, last year, how many were, how many D to D associate's degree graduates were there. Is it a, is it 10 or 15? Is that kind of the number or is it 30 or? Uh, we'll have to get that yeah. answer. Okay. <laughs> um, and then finally, you said you could go to Morgan or Towson University or University of Maryland College Park, I guess, or downtown University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Credits at CCBC are less expensive than at those other schools. Um, but are you entitled to a 50% discount at those other schools as well or just at CCBC? So the, the Senate bill um, talks about how it is the university's responsibility to offer at least four classes at any university at a 25% discount. So um, since we have the partnership with CCBC and they already only charge us 50%, that's where um, we then fund the other 50%. If there are families that take those four classes at a different university, um, we have agreed to pay 25% of the 
of that for them because that is the approximate cost of what the 50% at CCBC would be. So we, Baltimore County Public Schools, pay 50% of the CCBC mm -hmm. tuition mm -hmm. up to four credits or four courses. Yes. All right. Awesome. Thank you. So I never knew that you could get credits from Marlin Morgan or Towson. Is that a program widely advertised for students the way that CCBC is advertised for students? So it, it's not because it's not an actual program. We don't have a, a memorandum of understanding, unfortunately, with those schools. We love to and would actively you know, participate in that if we were given the opportunity. Um, it's a set of paper, it's a, paper, it's a piece of paper that has to be filled out and get processed and mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Young, any? Just one quick question. Earlier you mentioned um, having some of the professors come on site. Is that during the school day or is that after school or both? It's during the school day. Okay, thank you. Mr. Handy, talk some more about CTE. <laughs> <laughs> you really want that, Mr. Gillis? <laughs> so I will say CTE is very happy to be partnering. Um, with Dr. Woldridge, Dr. Wested on these programs, I will say that because it's it's really I think what helps us understand though that CTE is for students who are college bound as well as students that want to go directly into the world of work or into the military. So it gives us that that other pathway. Well, I for one thank all of you. I think this is just a fantastic program, and I know that uh, at least I know Mr. Handy more than the other programs, um, and he's a great champion of CTE. That's for sure. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs> Well, thank you. We um, wanted to make sure that you had a sense of how diverse our relationship with CCBC is and the multitude of opportunities that this partnership provides for our students um, in, in terms of their the rigor and their learning, the credit, the value added to their long-term trajectory, but also the savings for their families. So we just yeah. appreciate the opportunity to share. Okay, Thanks. thank you. So if we could have uh, Ms. Shea come forward to share with us um, the resources, uh, mathematics uh, supplemental materials um, called Everyday Counts Partner Games. Likewise, this is a, uh, these uh, contract will be coming forward, uh, I think next week, November as well? I think it is also November 8th, I think. I think, okay. So, um, but these are mathematical supplemental resources that we wanted to make sure that you had an understanding of what these resources were, why we have them, and how they support learning. Yes, good afternoon. Believe it or not, I'm gonna be the quickest tonight, which is never the case, I know. Um, <laughs> but this is, um, Everyday Counts um, is actually our calendar math. If you've been in any of our elementary schools, I'm sure you have seen that we use our calendars to help teach concepts of math and numeracy and some foundational concepts. And so this um, product, Everyday Counts, is actually partner games that build off some of those same um, skills. And so um, essentially the kit has 20 games and they are, as you can tell from the name, played with a partner, so two or more students. Um, and essentially um, they, and they are available, the directions and the game boards um, can be utilize for Spanish, um, which is an asset, especially for our growing population of English learners. Um, the purpose of these games is really to support foundational mathematical concepts and um, build essential number concepts or numeracy. Um, so I'll pass around some of the materials so you can see, but um, it focuses specifically on using visual images to um, help teach children to subitize, which is a really foundational skill for them to understand numeracy and build on those concepts of um, quantities, so smaller and bigger. What was the word again? Subitizing. Subitizing. Yeah, so that means being able to look and know without having to count. So when you roll a, a dice um, you, or a die, you know that's a five without having to count. So um, that actually reveals students' foundational skills and numeracy. So when they're able to quickly look at a visual image, see smaller quantities, so see two rows of five and know that that means 10 very rapidly. It's similar when you're developing reading, when you teach sight words or rapid automatic naming of letters, only from a mathematical perspective. Sure. <laughs> 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 
you can drop that word now at you know a cocktail party or something. But um, and so um, the idea of the games is also to promote that mathematical talk, so that math literacy and help students to build that mathematical vocabulary. Um, in particular, we use this product as part of our Title One summer school, and so you can see on this visual the elementary math portion of um, summer school is 70 minutes. So part of that is the teacher-led instruction using word problems and some of those investigation routines, and then part of it is small group and independent work. So these partner games are used as part of the small group instruction with teachers. So teachers work with small groups of kids playing these games to help support um, those concepts. And they actually can uh, do one of two things. They use the data from Dreambox to help identify individual student gaps and choose the games that match the student needs. Um, or in many cases, they have the children identify favorite games um, that they get to play to help um, solidify those foundational numeracy skills and again, build that math talk. Um, and so we recommend as part of this summer program or the extended learning opportunities that they use the grade level games for the grades that they have exited. And so um, that way we're continuing to build on that foundation for the upcoming agreement um, really solidify those um, foundations. And they do get to play the games for multiple days so that they are, um, there's opportunities built into the teacher plans for the teacher to dialogue with students and really get at the understanding that they're building. Um, and so, as Dr. Mercoma said, this is a contract that will be coming forward um, to be able to continue to purchase these materials as part of our Title I summer programming and then also Schools, um, some of our schools actually use these materials for some of their math centers or some of their small group as well. I will pass around the games. Yeah. Uh, first of all, um, thanks. It's, it's interesting. And I want to recognize that Mr. Young walked out of the room so he wouldn't laugh when I asked what subacy was. <laughs> he obviously already knew. He was being polite. Yeah. Um, what's the, eight, what's the, the, either the class number I mean the elementary school yes all so schools, these are or? for elementary um, students in particular for um, we use these particular games for rising first and second grade students um, and is there a digital component to this or is it all hands-on hard what you see in the box is what you get mm -hmm. um, for this particular portion so in is this something we have used in the past yes we have been using this for some time and uh, can you ballpark for us the number of students who touch the games so that would be difficult. So it would be all the students that enroll in the extended learning program for Title I. So I can get that number from Michelle Sansbury in Title I. So I have um, elementary schools that have used it in their classrooms as well. Um, and, and just to clarify your question, this particular product doesn't have a digital component, but the um, extended learning outcomes, uh, the summer program for Title I has a digital and a print. So this is sort of the hands-on version of that program. So if you were going to describe this, it would be primarily summer school. Its use is mostly in summer school, but teachers do use it in the classroom as some of their math center games for kids. <laughs> is there a way to measure the effectiveness thus far? So the Title I office would really be in a better position because they do work with DRA to measure the effectiveness of their summer programs. The challenge with that is it's a pretty limited time. So statistically, it's really difficult to say that any growth that happens in such a short window of summer programs, we really try to measure, um, I guess, the prevention of loss, if you will. So we're trying to prevent the typical summer slide is really our, our best way to describe it. Um, but they have been working, in, and again, I'd have to come back from uh, the type, my Title I partners would really be in a better position to specifically talk about that. So eventually this is just another tool or resource to help the little kiddies. It is another tool and resource to help the little kiddos with their mathematical foundational numeracy skills. Yes. Thank you. You got it. Hi, Mr. Young. How are you? Great, thanks. So, kindergarten, or no, um, first and second grade. Yes, rising first and second grade. Rising first and second grade. Mm -hmm. It is. Yep. Correct. Most, uh, most of the students that participate in the ELO program through Title I are students that have been identified, um, that, that teachers have identified as needing that additional support so that we don't lose ground over the summer months. They're fun. <laughs> Thank you. So just from seeing the box, there's different boxes for different grades. Correct. So this, we have the grade one box, you but do. that means there's at least three different boxes. Correct. And we primarily use first and second for this program. Great, thanks. You got it. So you gave us grade one because 
<laughs> Once he asked about subitizing, I figured Thank I would. Thank you, Misty Young. <laughs> I promise there's other people who didn't know that word Dubacy. either. Then <laughs> didn't want to ask. We support all our friends in learning. That's right. We support all our friends in learning. Absolutely. Okay. So if there's any Can more questions. Can you spell subacy and use it in a sentence? <laughs> <laughs> I probably could. <laughs> okay. Well, if there's no more questions, then um, I'm going to ask that uh, Mr. Briali and Ms. Glick come forward to share with you. Um, a presentation on the resource Tumble Books, which is a digital resource. Hello, good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're empty-handed, but there will be something that you can see in okay. just a few it's, minutes. It doesn't, so, this one doesn't come in a box. So <laughs> so don't worry, Mr. Young. We have something. So uh, first of all, I do want to introduce. I'm not sure the last time Fran was here. So I do want to uh, introduce Fran Glick, who is our coordinator of library media programs, and. Um, we're going to talk about Tumble Books. Uh, just to level set, uh, Tumble Books is coming to the board as a contract on the November 8th contracts meeting and then um, the board meeting. Tumble Books has been in Baltimore County for the last nine years, since 2010. Um, and uh, the product uh, was formally uh, purchased through a third party process where we worked with our uh, one of our major book providers and our asset allocation provider, Follett. So uh, most people know Follett in the book world. So Follett was the company where we were able to purchase Tumble Books from. They no longer are the third party provider for Tumble Books. So now we're just going right to Tumble Books to purchase the product. And that's why we're bringing it as a contract. But it has been uh, with Baltimore County since 2010. It's integrated into BCPS1. It's used in our library media programs. It's used in health ELA. Um, it's a K-12 product. Uh, it's in our science curriculum. It's in social studies. Um, and with that, I will let uh, Ms. Glick talk about it. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, our subscription to Tumble Books enables our students to have access to unlimited simultaneous resources for ebooks, interactive storybooks, audiobooks, and full text of popular, renowned fiction and nonfiction. There's also a segment of the resource that pairs nonfiction text with National Geographic videos. So it's a really robust set of resources for students. As Mr. Umbrielli mentioned, there are specific curricular integrations that we've made here in BCPS. And the variety of the resources enables us to meet the needs of a variety of learning styles and supports our students who are emergent readers, emerging literacy. There's also translation tools within the resource, so it translates into French and Spanish. And it doesn't just translate the text inside the book, the whole interface translates into the language. Uh, uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to mention a couple things that if you're in our elementary classrooms, uh, you will often see tumble books when um, our, the classroom may be doing, for instance, the daily five mm -hmm. instructional process. Uh, that's a typical time when you'll see students engaged in tumble books because at that point they're, they're doing a lot of potentially listening to reading, making those connections. Uh, the other thing that tumble books has is it has the whole suite of collections that are necessary for AP English courses. So when you think all the way through the spectrum when you're thinking about our smallest uh, mm -hmm. smallest learners to our seniors about to graduate. Um, they can also find those resources in AP English. The ease of access enables students to either uh, be specifically directed. So we've used a direct linking feature inside of our course maps and um, lesson resources for students. Students can access a link that takes them directly into the resource. But also, just this is a screenshot of what the interface looks like if you just went in naturally. And so you see that students are prompted to choose resources because they have full co color, title, and um, cover art so that it's easy to navigate. This is an example of the elementary interface. The secondary interface is very similar, just Oh, slightly more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. If you look at the profile of our usage, 
The numbers themselves are pretty staggering, but the numbers really only tell part of the story. Uh, as Mr. Ambriali mentioned, our ability to work across disciplines within our cur curriculum and instruction team has enabled us to leverage the resources in a way that support curriculum content, support student independent reading and practice. The fact that students who are not yet able to read are able to listen. The, the online storybooks that we're going to display in a minute track words as it's read aloud, so it helps support those emerging uh, readers. There's also some teacher resources that are hidden and um, inside of many of the titles, so there are teacher resources as well. If you just think about the fact that, you know, we, we kicked just a little bit over two million access points in last school year, it shows the robust nature of the resource and the incredible use that it has here in BCPS. Uh, another key here is it does provide the, and, and we've talked about this, the age-appropriate fiction and nonfiction uh, titles and texts for students. It's one of the only ones we have for nonfiction um, uh, in this in this approach. Let me, just, let me just add, you know, when we think about the nonfiction or even fiction for that matter, um, not just our emerging readers, but our students may be identified with dyslexic needs. The ability to hear and follow uh, visually and auditorily is very critical, and it, fortunately, and this is a universal access um, support system, but I just want to uh, help ensure that everyone understands the complexity of nonfiction uh, text often is a challenge for students who can read but may struggle to read. Uh, and this is a, a resource that really has a lot of built-in resources, and I know Ms. Glick had mentioned how it has um, Spanish translations as well as other languages. Thank you. We wanted you to just get a peek at um, how one of the animated storybooks works. This is one of Mr. Young's favorite books. Do you know the story? <laughs> one day, Stephanie went to her mom and said, None of the kids in my class have a ponytail. I want a nice ponytail coming right out the back. So Stephanie's mom gave her a nice ponytail coming right out the back. When Stephanie went to school, the other kids looked at her and said, A golly, a golly, very a golly. Stephanie said, it's my ponytail, and I like it. You'll have to log in if you want to find out what happens <laughs> in the rest of the story. But as you can tell just from listening to the narration, it's not a machine reader. It's a natural voice reader uh, with expressive use of language, which is a really powerful way for students who are learning to read to learn how to use the power of voice in, in reading. Excellent. We have time for questions. Yes, the next slide is just questions. So question. the next slide says questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of questions, if I may. Um, uh, this is obviously all digital and, and no real books. Mm -hmm. And many people that read digitally have little e-readers, but this is only accessible for our children on the computers that the school gives them, or they can, is there a way for them to get it to an e-reader? Any browser. Uh, yes, so if the e-reader has a browser. Uh -huh. Right, it is device agnostic, so they could use any, any tool that they would have that would have a browser. They could then um, connect through BCPS1 mm -hmm. and have access to the whole suite of the collection. Mm -hmm. um, and for younger kids versus older kids, first grade versus 12th grade, even the print or the font changes in these books? You can adjust the fonts. Um, the, the interface for the secondary students is a much more traditional book looking you know, that you would read on any other e-reader or in print. It's a very book page looking. 
the animated, what we showed you was more of the animated sure. version, but there's the more static, more traditional ebook as well. And then does Tumblebook uh, do the selection of the materials or does somehow Baltimore County Public Schools get to select what the materials are, the books themselves? You're subscribing to a library of books. Uh -huh. uh, that, that those resources come from everyone from like Harcourt, Simon & Schuster, National Geographic. Uh, there's the, they're very recent too. What's the example of the book that just released last year that's now available? Uh, okay. Is it Ivan? The one and only Ivan, which is yeah. a few years old, but it's still very popular. It still sells in print, but it, there are incredible authors who have, have relationships with the company who are willing to have their work uh -huh. there. And classics as well? Yes, um, mm -hmm. and lots of classics. Mm -hmm. um, we did have, uh, we do have the opportunity to mute specific titles. So we noticed last year a couple of graphic novels uh, at the secondary level that were a little more mature for our community and we asked the company to take those down for us. Thank you. So in the same way in our school libraries, we apply a selection policy. We do the same with the tumble books. Gotcha, thanks. I love tumble books. I used to <laughs> use tumble books all the time. Um, I read a lot of amazing books and tumble books. That's just <laughs> my. Your endorsement here is the one that matters the most. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just earlier, you mentioned um, translation tools. You, you specifically called out um, French and Spanish, but I'm assuming that there are other languages that it will translate into? There are some there limited are, languages. Yeah, there are yeah. some. It, it depends on the resource or the, or the book itself, but there are some versions of Chinese, German, Russian. So those, those do exist. Right. It's not every book in... 10 different languages, it's, you know, you may find That's a correct. book in a certain book in, as you said, Korean, but not in Japanese, you know, something that, like that's that. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. But when you, what's interesting is, what I think is particularly powerful is it, when you, should you choose to translate the interface to Spanish or French, which are those dominant languages, um, they're a, a Canadian company, so the French makes sense. The um, <laughs> The whole, the whole page changes. So that for a student who speaks Spanish as their heritage language, they get a, the whole interface delivered to them in their heritage language. And I'll just add for also our students who are learning to become proficient in Spanish, it gives them an authentic opportunity to, to read um, as a Spanish speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This really concludes our agenda for this evening's curriculum committee. Thank you.